and I'll look to HSBS student, Theodore Grammar, St. John's College, Cambridge, to continue the case for the proposition. The opposition comes up here tonight and tells us, either we implement the cap or we continue with our foundation programs. Either we implement the cap or we reform our educational system in a meaningful way. And we ask them on site proposition, why not do both? There has not been any single systematic reason given by side opposition for which we would not be able to do both of them. And I tell them more on site proposition. Rather, it is on our side of the house when Oxford and Cambridge know that they will have to have 93% of their students from state schools, it is then that they will have the greatest incentive to make sure that they reach out to those students, that they help them be as well prepared as possible for when they actually get into Cambridge, when they diversify the access schemes that they give to them, when they have more open days, when they have stronger and more robust foundations programs than they do currently. We see and we welcome the current tendency inside of both Oxford and Cambridge to increase access to working class students to state school students. But it is not enough. And the increases that we have seen so far are far too slow for us to be able to properly integrate everyone in society. It is about time that we recognize that being in a private school does not entitle you to enter Oxford and Cambridge and that only if we gave them the chance, state school students have uh, all that they need in order to impress Oxford, Cambridge, and wider British society as well. A couple of things that I want to say in relation to the opposition case so far. We, we hear this point from first opposition that there's this idea that we push privately educated pupils into sort of very highly selective grammar schools and that there's essentially no effect to our policy. Two things here. First of all, I wager that most families that have gone to Eton or Westminster or any of these private schools are not going to give up on their tradition of sending every single generation of children in their family to this beautiful and privileged, uh, privileged private school that they've always sent them to. It is likely that they'll still stick to it because we don't outlaw private school students from going to Oxford or Cambridge. They're just going to tell their kids to go to Eton or Westminster and to just do better and make sure that they're part of those 7% that actually get into Oxford. But secondly, assume that opposition is right. Oh, whatever will we do, some privately educated students are going to instead have to go to these highly selective grammar schools. The thing with these highly selective grammar schools is that as opposed to private schools, they have one less huge obstacle when it comes to accessing them, that is finances. That means that they're highly likely to have more students from a more diverse background, to have just smart students that really did really well on, um, uh, in school previously and managed to get, no thank you, and managed to get into, um, into these highly selective grammar schools. They're generally more diversified than is the case with private schools. So this means that they will actually have contact with some other people who are outside of their bubble. They'll have a higher likelihood of understanding what it is the experience to be someone who's not born, uh, born rich and someone who's not lived a life of luxury, but someone who's actually worked hard, worked hard and who deserves the things that uh, they have coming their way. We have a situation where we're going to have way more of these very privileged students going into back, uh, going into schools where they meet up with people who are different from them, which increases their empathy and their chance to actually be decent human beings that value other human beings, not for their worth, not for their family's net worth, but rather for their worth as human beings. So that's, th that's uh, off with the, the uh, pushing privately educated pupils into grammar schools. But before that, sure. And where has grammar schools in the UK? The socioeconomic diverse areas of Buckinghamshire and Cheltenham, or parts of the UK that really need good educational systems? Right. So. Again, we don't claim that with our, with our measure we're going to suddenly solve everything in the educational system. But it's at least a step forward towards a situation where we have equal opportunity and genuine opportunity for more people than is the case in the present. Okay, furthermore, when it comes to the first opposition, what for the first opposition has told us so far, the idea that we're not tackling the grammar slash comprehensive division. Okay, but what, what, 
concrete measure has been proposed by the opposition to tackle the grammar slash comprehensive school division. None, because this debate is not about the grammar slash comprehensive school division, but rather the state versus private school division in a situation in which we are addressing. And also, by the way, if you really want our, our answer, no thank you, if you really want our, our answer, we can also introduce quotas on, uh, on highly selective grammar schools later down the line. That's perfectly consistent with our position. We're really curious to hear what you have to suggest for that. Okay, now let me tackle another point that has not been brought up so far in this debate. And let me talk about changing the culture in Oxbridge and how that might actually genuinely help both the people who are part of the in-group in Oxbridge, the very privileged ones, as well as, and most importantly, the people who are part of, part of the out-group. Oftentimes, in both Oxford and Cambridge, we see the same friendship groups or people belonging to very similar environments and socioeconomic backgrounds congregating and forming these highly impenetrable networks of people in both universities. We see people who went, who went to, similar high, to similar private schools who maybe know each other from even before going into university, congregating and sticking to one another when they're in university, because why wouldn't they after all? What this does, no thank you, what this does is this actually perpetuates a very toxic community culture that exists in both Oxford and Cambridge. One that centers around highly expensive and privileged events and one that automatically and by default excludes working class students. How many of you have been on the varsity ski trip? Probably some of you, but this is not something that is accessible to everyone. Yet it is still, no thank you, it is still regarded as part of the Cambridge or Oxford experience. Similarly, there are many other events, such as Mabel in the case of Cambridge, not sure whether you have those in Oxford, I don't know, no idea. Um, and many other events that are highly exclusionary by nature and which now form the core and the gist of the Cambridge and Oxford experience. What happens on our side of the house? They just don't because there's more people who are part of a less privileged background because they have a, ge a more genuine shot of getting into these two university universities, it is highly likely that we will dissenter these experiences. Why does that matter? First of all, because when it comes to the students that, make part, that are part of the out group in these, university, in, in these universities, it's usually the case that they feel out of place, that they feel like don't, they don't belong in the places in which they have, they've arrived, that they're not worthy of actually enjoying their experience there because it seems like the people who enjoy their experience there the most are not people like them. They're not people that they can relate to, and the sorts of activities that are expected of them, and the sorts of activities that they're expected to engage in are things that they either can't afford or they just don't feel like doing because it's not their sort of crowd. This has really detrimental long-term impact because we're talking about a situation in which you feel like the university that technically is part of your formative years is a place that does not welcome you, that makes you feel unwanted. It is no thank you, it is highly likely that many of, the, many of the mental health issues that many of the working class students and lower income students face when coming to Oxford or Cambridge are derived from the fact that they don't feel at home, that they feel like there's something wrong with them for not wanting to join into these very tightly knit networks of people. This is what, for example, drives down educational achievement in many instances in both Oxford and Cambridge. But we're also talking about the people who are in the in-groups, the fact that they perpetuate their very privileged lifestyle that they've had in high school, in Eton or Westminster by just having a very privileged lifestyle in university with roughly the same people, maybe some rough differences around the edges. In that situation, you end up in a place where, again, they don't get to experience what it feels like to interact with other human beings who do not share their context, and we end up to having the same effects that Lucia talked to you about in, when it comes to long-term policy decisions, because our lawmaker class in this country is sadly made up of people who are from the same backgrounds, who are part of the same cliques, and who have not had the chance to personally experience what it is to have a different, uh, a different upbringing, to belong to a different socioeconomic background rather than the one they, they went to. So in these circumstances, we think that our policy has a chance to help us get rid of some of these very toxic cultural habits and cultural norms that exist in Oxford and Cambridge. Again, on our side of the house, we don't claim that we solve all of the problems of the educational system, and there's still much to do. But what we tell you is, first of all, we have the chance to give an active and structural incentive to both Oxford and Cambridge to make sure that they cater to and provide for the state school students that they're now going to have to take in the 93% the that we're talking about. 
first of all. And second of all, we have a higher chance of changing the culture, changing the very meaning of what it means to be a Cambridge and Oxford away from something that is very privileged and exclusionary almost by definition to something that is more open to other people that do not belong to the same castes that have been created in British society. Thank you.